I was totally amazed that an illegal substance that to me was garbage was helping me medically. And I was bedbound for about five years. I couldn't hold a job. I had to quit school. I was near death. I believe that medical marijuana saved my life. I see it as a kind of wonder drug of our time. What this really is, is the marijuana legalization lobby taking advantage of sick patients. Legitimate sick patients need legitimate medications. It's a medicine. If it is a medicine, how come it is not regulated through medical fields? Never in my career did I find a chemical so ill-qualified to be defined as a pharmaceutical. I think the biggest problem is that you're talking about a highly impure substance. You get all this stuff that's floating around in marijuana. 488 substances, 66 cannabinoids. If you find a positive effect, then that justifies drilling down deeper and deeper to see where this positive effect is coming from. There's quite a bit of evidence that suggested that cannabis would be useful for a number of indications. Migraine and nausea and vomiting. Marijuana contains anti-inflammatory, uh, antioxidant, and probably anti-cancer compounds. We found that cannabinoids can almost completely cure uh, cancers in these mice. Do you think that there has been much of a conversation about the science? Not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. I think the political uh, controversies have harmed the research side. You would think that our policies in this country should be driven by science, but I think for the most part they're not. I'm not one for just sitting around. I gotta be out, and it's outdoor stuff. I'm not much for going to a gym to work out. My physical exercise, I have to be outdoors doing it. For Point Hatfield, the mountains and rivers of Montana have always been a certain kind of therapy. Running and river guiding in the summer and teaching backcountry skiing in the winter have helped him through life's many difficulties. But the greatest challenge of his life took the outdoors away from him. It was like Two days after New Year's, it just dumped two feet of snow, and a group of us skied from Mammoth down to Gardner after work, and we went out for dinner. And when we were sitting, having dinner, I just went like this, and, hmm, there's a lump there. I had a radical neck dissectomy. So they cut out this side of my neck. They took out the cardiosternomastis muscle and all the lymph nodes. But the cancer came back. Two more tumors and another surgery later, it was clear Hatfield would have to endure chemotherapy and radiation. Chemo and radiation were horrible. Literally horrible. Because I was throwing up almost all day long every day. I zapped every ounce of life I had in me just about. I was just hanging on by a thread. Just like he used to, Hatfield turned to the outdoors for comfort, trying to ski a small hill in his backyard. So I got two runs of two turns in, and then that's all I could do, wake me out. Two days after that, I went cross-country skiing with my wife, and I was able to do about a mile. That's all I could do. I was exhausted. Then after the third round of treatment, I couldn't do anything. Hatfield's athletic frame melted from 160 pounds of muscle to barely 124 pounds. I used to have 15-inch arms, biceps. They went down to 9 inches. I used to have thick legs. I'm skinny now. I'm not used to being skinny. Are there things that you know that kind of trigger um, your nausea and things like that? No, it just comes. It's just like that, it just comes. And we've used the other anti-nausea medications with you. I was on Ativan. Mm -hmm. I was on Zoloft. I think Zofran too. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple of steroids that I wore a patch with. 
I think it was a couple other drugs, too, that they tried. Dr. Jack Hensold is Hatfield's oncologist. He says these are common anti-nausea medications that work for most patients. We have very good anti-nausea medications now, and, and you know, I make a little bit of an advertisement for that right now. People don't get sick on chemotherapy as they used to because the standard anti-nausea medications are so good. But Point Hatfield wasn't one of those patients. It just did not work. Not at all? Not at all. Didn't alleviate anything. So what was the next step? Well, then Dr. Hensel would ask me if I would be willing to try medical marijuana. I said, I'll try anything. We've had patients who've tolerated very well, and it's done some really good things for them. Even though Hatfield had his doctor's blessing, he still needed the green light from Wendy Gwenner the hospital's oncology social worker. We had a fair number of patients who came out of the woodwork who um, probably were users anyway and said, well, gosh, I've got cancer. Um, can I get a card? And the answer is no, you can't. Gwenner carefully evaluated Hatfield's case, just like she does with every patient, before signing off on the medical marijuana recommendation. We have to be screening you and making sure that we've used appropriate medications as first-line treatment if our anti-emetic medicines have not worked well, um, and we've gone through our cadre of um, medicines, then we would go to medical marijuana. After I got the medical marijuana, it just alleviated so much of that sick, pukey feeling, and alleviated the throwing up. Immediately? Immediately. Wow. Immediately. It's like it was a godsend. It was a wonderful thing, because that throwing up all the time is not good. Right, right. I believe that the medical marijuana saved my life. I couldn't eat anything, couldn't swallow, and I think it just saved, I just think it saved my life. Five years after he was first diagnosed, Hatfield is cancer-free and enjoying Montana's beauty again. Nowadays, he says the beauty isn't the only thing he loves about this state. He loves the progressive voters who passed the state's compassionate use medical marijuana law in 2004, allowing patients like him the option of using a drug at the center of a growing controversy. There's a false stigma attached to it, and I'm doing this interview to help other people. Why not? It's our job to help other people. It's our responsibility. If we can do something for people, why not do it? If something can help somebody, why not let those people have that? Impassioned pleas from patients just like Hatfield have been the spark behind a nationwide movement to allow access to marijuana as a medicine. By the fall of 2010, 15 states had passed laws similar to Montana's. This is all in direct conflict with federal law. Since the 1970s, the U.S. government has considered marijuana a dangerous drug, one with a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. It's known as a Schedule I drug, the most restricted category. Marijuana shares its Schedule I status with drugs like heroin, ecstasy, and LSD. Drugs that have a high potential for abuse but do have an accepted medical value are placed on Schedule II. Some of the drugs currently on Schedule II are methamphetamine, cocaine, opium, and morphine. Doctors can legally prescribe medications on Schedule II. They cannot prescribe Schedule I drugs. So doctors like Hensold cannot legally prescribe marijuana to patients like Hatfield. Instead, state marijuana initiatives carve out a gray area allowing doctors to make a recommendation for medical use. But they do so at their own peril, since the federal government still views any marijuana use, even medical, as illegal. The government publicly says, well, marijuana's not a medicine because we don't have enough studies to show it, or we don't have this, or we don't have that. And you go, well, here I am. You've been sending me this for 28 years. Every month, Florida stockbroker Urban Rosenfeld receives a tin of 300 federally grown and rolled marijuana cigarettes, complete with a legal marijuana prescription glued to the side. Does it seem hypocritical to you? Of course it's hypocritical. Of course it is. I mean, the fact that they've been giving it to me for all this time, they've given me over 120,000 medical marijuana cigarettes so far in my lifetime. In the 28 years, 120,000. 
Rosenfeld is one of four surviving public patients in a little-known federal program. I show my tin can, I show my marijuana, they go, what? What do you mean the federal government grows this? What do you mean the federal government supplies this? They have no idea. It was called the Federal Investigational New Drug Program. Since applications to the program are confidential, the exact number of patients who made it in is unknown. Rosenfeld believes he was one of about a dozen patients who received legal marijuana cigarettes from the federal government. We were able to convince the government that nothing else worked, and so they had no choice but to give it to us. Rosenfeld argued he needed marijuana to treat his terrible pain, caused by a rare disorder diagnosed at age 10. It's called multiple congenital cartilaginous excystosis, which is, means bone tumors on the end of long bones, that whatever tumors I had at puberty will grow as I grow. They mostly grow outwardly into the muscles in the veins, stretching the muscles in the veins, making it very painful and very tender. I'd be screaming and crawling on the floor for two hours, trying to get the muscles to get back in place. And then once they finally got back in place, the, two, the muscles would be so torn that I couldn't walk for three days. On top of the pain was the knowledge that any of the hundreds of benign tumors in his body could become malignant at any time. Rosenfeld spent his youth and teen years on synthetic morphine, muscle relaxants, and sleeping pills. By age 20, he was taking more than 200 pills a month, and he was a vocal critic of illegal drugs. I hear kids talk about drugs and things like that, and I go, why are you doing drugs? I mean, look at all I have to do. You'd be thankful you're healthy. Even so, Rosenfeld finally gave in to peer pressure and tried marijuana in college. He says he didn't feel anything and decided the drug was useless and that his friends were just imagining they were high. But a strange thing happened one night while smoking marijuana and playing chess with a friend. Rosenfeld did something he hadn't done in years. He sat comfortably for 30 full minutes. I thought, well, wait a minute, in what way did I take all the narcotics and drugs I had to allow me to sit? And I thought, gee, I haven't taken a pill in six hours. Well, then how can I sit? And just then, it was my turn with the joint. They handed me the joint. I looked at this piece of garbage, because to me, it's all it was. I said, this is the only thing I've done differently. I've smoked this garbage. I wonder if there's any medical benefit to this garbage. Rosenfeld had stumbled onto another potential medical use for cannabis, chronic pain. When he joined the federal program in the 80s, he became one of a rare group of medical marijuana patients, patients who could speak openly without fear of arrest about its medical benefits. Their stories added some legitimacy to an expanding body of anecdotal evidence. Medical marijuana has grown to a point where the government looks foolish saying it's not a medicine. It is a medicine. 82-year-old retired Harvard professor Dr. Lester Grinspoon is well-versed in the anecdotal evidence surrounding medical marijuana. He's told Urban Rosenfeld's story along with many other patients' stories in his book Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine. His opinion of cannabis has come a long way since he first began investigating it as a young assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard in the late 60s. Back then, he certainly did not see it as a medicine. Uh, Back then, he certainly did not see it as a medicine. I uh, could only see from my ivory tower that lots of people were using marijuana. I had uh, a concern that uh, marijuana was... A terribly dangerous, I believed it, a terribly dangerous drug. And why wouldn't he? The 1930s era film Reefer Madness was a dramatic manifestation of government and media claims about the dangers of marijuana. The film portrays marijuana smokers as delirious, insane even homicidal. Dr. Grinspoon was gravely concerned and he wanted to give young students the proof that marijuana was hurting them. I went into the library and started to look at this. I wanted to provide a scientific and medical basis for the prohibition. What, what was the government standing on and saying that this was uh, a dangerous drug? Psychotic reactions can happen. Marijuana is now known to initiate depressive episodes, um, delusional episodes, manic episodes, and even psychotic episodes. Dr. Eric Voth is an internal medicine physician and an addiction and pain specialist in Topeka, Kansas. He's also the chairman of the Institute on Global Drug Policy and has advised former presidents Reagan, Bush Sr., Bush Jr., and Clinton on drug policy. 
A critic of medical marijuana, he says one of his biggest concerns is the risk of mental illness, especially schizophrenia. But there are clearly patients where it kind of uncaps the psychosis. Schizophrenia is a, is a form of a psychotic illness, and uh, uncapping it in people who didn't know they had it, uh, there have been episodes, again, of people who have, have sort of uncapped and continued schizophrenic that did not have it ahead of time. Indeed, research has shown a connection between marijuana use and schizophrenia. There is also great concern over marijuana use in teens and young adults because their brains are still developing. But it's still unclear whether marijuana causes mental illness or someone with a mental illness is more likely to use marijuana. As a psychiatrist, Dr. Grinspoon's expertise was in schizophrenia, and he strongly disagrees with critics who say marijuana may trigger the disease. I think that is absurd. If you just take the fact that schizophrenia, the frequency of schizophrenia is about 1% the world around. Now, you would expect with a drug that's used as often as it is, you would expect that this, there'd be a little bleep in this. It, do, it doesn't change a bit. It hasn't changed. I, in fact, you can find as much literature about how cannabis is useful to schizophrenic patients as it's harmful. Dr. Grinspoon could not find evidence to back up the government and media reports that marijuana use leads to drug-induced violence. <laughs> and incurable insanity. He is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. This substance, the most harmful thing about it, was not any inherent psychopharmacological property of the drug, but rather the way we as a society were treating uh, the people who use this drug. It's been a medicine for about 3,000 years now. It only hasn't been a medicine in this country for 68 years. I say in the scheme of things, it's been a medicine a whole lot longer than it hasn't been. Dr. Donald Abrams is a professor of clinical medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and an oncology physician at San Francisco General Hospital. He says doctors were able to freely prescribe cannabis for various ailments up until 1937. Harry Anslinger, who was a, a prohibitionist and the first head of the Federal Narcotics Bureau, uh, decided to introduce the so-called Marijuana Tax Act. Physicians in the United States knew the medicine as cannabis, and by using marijuana, he sort of did an end run around the medical community. The act imposed a high tax on medical marijuana and such onerous registration and reporting requirements that it effectively banned its use as a medicine altogether. The American Medical Association came out in opposition to the act, with Dr. William C. Woodward testifying there was no evidence the medical use of cannabis was causing addiction, and that there are evident potentialities in the drug that should not be shut off by adverse legislation. He opined that it's impossible to foresee how much the new regulations will deprive the public of the benefits of a drug that, on further research, may prove to be of substantial value. The Marijuana Tax Act delivered the final blow to a medicine that was already being replaced by the opiates and aspirin. Cannabis was removed from the U.S. Pharmacopoeia in 1942. The fact that cannabis was an accepted, valuable medicine in the United States for nearly a century might be surprising to the teens who grew up watching the dramatizations of reefer madness. It certainly came as a surprise to Dr. Grinspoon. I discovered when I got into the library that I, despite my training in science and medicine, had been brainwashed. Like he put his house. findings into an 80-page paper, aptly titled Marijuana Reconsidered. It was later published in Scientific American. Then his professional investigation of cannabis took an unexpected personal turn. His son Danny, suffering from childhood leukemia, had begun chemotherapy. The chemotherapeutics that he had to receive were just devastating to him in terms of the nausea and vomiting. It's a nausea that goes right down to your toenails. I mean, it's, it's really beyond description. Even with all his prior research, Dr. Grinspoon still had no idea that marijuana might be able to stop Danny's chemotherapy-induced nausea. 
One night at a dinner party, an oncology doctor who had read his paper on marijuana related the story of a 17-year-old with leukemia who used marijuana to treat his terrible nausea. On the way home in, uh, from there in the car, my wife Betsy asked me.、Uh, Don't you think we ought to get a little bit of marijuana for Danny the next time he gets? And I said, <laughs> I'm almost ashamed to say this. I said, No, no, no. That would be breaking the law, and I don't want to offend the physicians, you know, who are taking care of him.、Uh, and I, so I was against it.、Uh, she's a rather plucky woman, and next time he came in for his、uh, chemotherapy, she went up to the Wellesley. High school parking lot, and they found his friend uh, Mark, uh, and asked him if he, Mrs. Grinspoon, <laughs> wanted a little bit of marijuana. When Dr. Grinspoon showed up for Danny's chemo treatment, he was surprised to find his wife and Danny so relaxed. They were joking, and he seemed he was smiling, and no problem.、Uh, he, he got on the gurney, had the injection, and whereas. Before, with this particular chemo, he became nauseous, felt awful right away,、uh, and the race to get home before he started to vomit, and then in a bed with a with a bucket at his side there until it was just dry heaves. That day, he got off the gurney. He said, "Hey, mom, there's a sub sandwich on Brookline Avenue. I noticed. Could we get a sub on the way home?" When he discovered Danny had smoked marijuana, Doctor Grinspoon was not angry. He was relieved. And I called the doctor, the attending who was taking care of him, and I said,、uh, "You know, I'm not going to stand in his way doing this again." He said, "Don't, don't, and don't have him do it in the parking lot. I want to see this myself." And so it went. He never had any difficulty with nausea and vomiting, with the further treatments for as long as he lived. He was free of that anxiety, and I can tell you. It was not only a relief for him; it was a relief for his parents and his siblings.、Uh, it was a godsend. Not surprisingly, Dr. Grinspoon has become an ardent supporter of legalizing marijuana for medical use. People who suffer from these symptoms and syndromes, depending on just how serious they are, that's always accompanied by anxiety, and to take an Artificially impose another level of anxiety, the anxiety involved in doing something which is illegal, for which you can be punished, is cruel. By the 1980s, scientific interest in cannabis had begun to catch up with the personal experiences. According to a 1982 United States Institute of Medicine report, Marijuana and Health, the preliminary research, coupled with anecdotal evidence, warranted a closer look at medicinal cannabis. The report also found that marijuana attacks diseases and symptoms differently than other drugs. This offered the tantalizing possibility for drug companies to develop new, novel drugs out of the chemicals in the marijuana plant. The Institute of Medicine called for more research on these chemicals, known as cannabinoids. Even with this encouragement, research on cannabis failed to flower. There aren't many scientists or clinical investigators who are particularly interested in doing research in medical marijuana because it's such a hassle. Marijuana's Schedule One status means Dr. Abrams has to get approval from more than a half dozen regulatory bodies before he can start a cannabis medical trial. There are so many roadblocks that you have to go through. Marijuana is an illegal substance、um, that I think a lot of investigators and uh, and uh, even organizations just don't want to get involved in something that is so controversial. Dr. Igor Grant is a professor of psychiatry and the director of the California-based Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. He says not only is the research bureaucratically difficult, it's expensive, and financial backers are hard to find. You know, an ordinary、uh, investigator just does not have the time or resources to do this kind of work. I mean, you really need,、uh, you know, either federal or state funding or pharma funding something. To, to navigate、uh, this whole system, the center's research was funded by a nine million dollar grant from California taxpayers. The money allowed for a few legitimate small marijuana trials, including several done by Dr. Abrams, that confirmed what Rosenfeld was saying all along: 
that cannabis works on pain, especially pain that does not respond to opiates. All of them, to some extent or another, demonstrated that smoked marijuana is effective in this situation for which we really don't have very good treatments. I can say that the cannabinoids are, are almost certain to be useful in neuropathic pain based on the research that we've done. But even when researchers get significant results like this, Dr. Abrams says cannabis research can still be an academic dead end. When I submit it for publication, I have found what I perceive to be a publication bias, that people are not particularly interested in publishing data suggesting that marijuana might have some benefits. All of those things, I think, sort of dampen anybody's enthusiasm to take on medical marijuana research. And scientists are not getting much help from pharmaceutical companies either. No pharmaceutical company is interested in supporting, you know, marijuana research. Because it's a naturally occurring substance out in the world, so you can't patent it per se. So the research on it is, is quite dicey. It really is. Nobody can make any money on that, that research or on that development. Even if drug companies created a novel marijuana plant drug that they could patent, doctors could not prescribe it. It's going to be a, a class one type of drug. You know, it's not going to be broadly used. And again, why do you want to spend a lot of time developing a drug that, that you can't really sell? Why would a pharmaceutical company want to get involved with something like that? I think until, uh, you know, marijuana is rescheduled, large-scale research will probably not occur. Advocates have been mired in a decades-long legal fight with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency to do just that. In the late 80s, they made the argument that marijuana has accepted medical value and that it belongs on Schedule II. It was all the judge who my understanding was basically suggested that it be made a Schedule II. According to government documents, the DEA's administrative law judge, Francis Young, found there was incontrovertible evidence that cannabis was an effective medical treatment for nausea and appetite loss, multiple sclerosis and spinal cord injury spasms. Judge Young ruled marijuana should be moved to Schedule II, writing, the evidence in this record clearly shows that marijuana has been accepted as capable of relieving the distress of great numbers of very ill people. It would be unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious for DEA to continue to stand between those sufferers and the benefits of this substance. For those who were concerned about marijuana's side effects, Young ruled that as a medicine under a doctor's supervision, marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. The DEA and other federal agencies disagreed. They overruled Judge Young's decision and kept marijuana on Schedule One. But the ruling did add to growing pressure on the U.S. government to go beyond its own compassionate use program and make marijuana legally available as a medicine. The answer? Provide a pill that can do what the plant does. For years, the government had been sponsoring and funding research to put the active ingredient in marijuana, THC, into a capsule form. Known as dronabinol or marinol, the drug is a synthetic version of THC created in the laboratory. Since it did not come directly from the plant, the DEA placed it on Schedule II. They wanted to have an answer to people like me. There is a medicine out there that people can buy. They don't have to use herbal marijuana. Dr. Grinspoon says the problem is marinol does not work as well as marijuana. You take people who have used both herbal marijuana, smoked it or ingested it, and Marino or Durdambino. Every time, never an exception, oh, I much prefer uh, herbal marijuana. It was my experience when AIDS patients first started taking Durdambinol back in 1992 that they didn't like it. The absorption when taken orally of THC is very variable and low. The gut only absorbs 12 percent, plus or minus a few percent depending on the individual. The problem with taking it through the gut, you have to wait for an hour and a half to two hours to know whether you're getting relief from the pain or the nausea or whatever it is you're trying to relieve. How does Marinol compare in all this? I was talking earlier, I mean, do you feel like it's as effective as the plant or no? No. I do not believe Marinol is as effective as, as marijuana or THC. And why do you say that? I've never really seen it work. We've added on, it's expensive, and I've never had a patient who seemed to get much benefit from it.
We really haven't had very much success with patients with Marinol for any um, side effect management. So there's something that is lost in um, with the THC in that processing. Dr. Abrams says what's lost in the processing are all the other cannabinoids in the plant, some of which are known to mitigate the high associated with THC, making the patient feel more relaxed instead of anxious. There are 400 other compounds in the plant, including 70 other sort of lookalikes to Delta 9 THC, and those are all there for a reason. They provide balance, if you will, the yin and the yang. And, you know, my opinion that you lose that balance when you remove the single most psychoactive component from the plant and, and use that.